what do you recommend in terms of nutritional supplements that each of us should or shouldn't take? Well, there's, there's no skipping. There's no uh, not honoring our needs for vitamin B12. Um, it used to be in the drinking water. It used to be in the, uh, when we lived earth connected lives, we used to be on unwashed vegetables, but welcome to the 21st century. Nobody's drinking out of streams. Nobody's uh, eating unwashed vegetables. And uh, the exchange we make with modern sanitation is that our natural, quote, these 12 sources uh, have been taken away. So we have to, uh, if we want to be pure plant eaters, uh, consume some B12 uh, on a uh, twice weekly, three times weekly basis. And it's, it's no joke. Uh, if, you, if you let those levels go too low, you really risk injuring your brain, your spinal cord, uh, and letting homocysteine build up in your artery walls, setting you up for strokes and heart attacks. So uh, have something, uh, either a supplement or fortified food with vitamin B12, at least twice a week, three times a week, somewhere in the anywhere between 100 to 500 microgram range, three times a week should be more than enough for most folks. Uh, after that, it depends what your actual food stream really consists of. Um, zinc can be a challenging mineral for vegans to get. Uh, it's in whole grains and legumes, uh, but you got to really eat the beans and the lentils and, and the grains. And uh, if you're not, if you're living on processed foods, you may wind up short of, uh, of uh, zinc. Vitamin D uh, was never a problem a million years ago. We lived out naked in the sunshine, lots of B12, lots of vitamin D on our skin. But now we're all living inside lives here. We're afraid to go out in the sun. And so vitamin D levels are going down. And there's a question whether low D levels increase the risk for everything from infections to cancers, et cetera. So whether it's a good idea to keep your vitamin D level up uh, over 35 micrograms uh, per liter um, th that might be part of a supplement program. Uh, and the other two would be iodine. Uh, if you're not eating fish, uh, you need iodine for thyroid function and other functions in the body. Uh, and if the soil, it used to be in the soils, but we've let a lot of that leach out. Uh, and as an insurance policy, 150 micrograms of iodine, preferably in sea vegetables that you add some, uh, uh, some wakame or some aramate to a soup or a salad or have some nori slices during the day. But if not, if you're taking a vegan multivitamin, yeah, 150 micrograms of iodine, probably a nice thing they have in there. And then the last thing is uh, DHA and EPA, whether, and this is controversial, whether you think uh, having a low omega-3 index is a problem or not. Uh, if you think it's a problem and it's below four, you should probably the, some studies suggest, nobody knows, uh, but um, some studies suggest that taking uh, EPA and DHA from algae uh, may help maintain mentation and mental acuity. It may do absolutely nothing for that. You might make all the, the DHA and EPA you need right in your brain cells. Any exogenous DHA might be a complete waste of time and money. I'm open to that possibility, but that would be the other aspect of a supplement program. So B12 for sure, possible or at least consider vitamin D, iodine, zinc, uh, and DHA, EPA. Um, that's about all you would need. You know, Thank you. and I would, oh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. Well, I was just going to say, you know, what some things like zinc are proportional to what your diet like. If you're on a high phytate diet, your need for zinc may be higher. But if you're not eating a lot of refined carbohydrates, the amount of zinc that you actually need may be uh, adequately provided by the, the primary diet. Uh, and the same thing's true with iodine. If you're eating lots of green vegetables that weren't all grown in Minnesota, where the soils are depleted in iodine, you're less likely to have a problem. Or if you include, say, some sea vegetables, like Dr. Clapper mentioned, uh, iodine is not going to be something that you're going to need pills and potions for. For most people that are eating um, uh a good uh, whole plant food diet, they're going to get enough essential fatty acids to convert to dehydroxyhexoxonic acid, and their ratios should be preserved. Um, some people, for example, can't eat nuts or seeds, or they have issues that prevent them from doing that. Maybe those people might have to consider supplementation. But for, for most people, I think the, the one argument you could make a pretty solid case for is B12. As you mentioned, you know, we don't get the fecal contamination from the dead decaying flesh if you're on a vegan diet. You don't get the contamination from the environment since B12 is only from bacteria. Uh, and we're careful as we should be about our hygiene because we want to avoid worms and parasites and other problems. Supplementing B12 for vegans makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Clapper's you know, list. Uh, the one thing that I would add is zinc um, is probably best not taken as a single nutrient supplement unless you have a confirmed zinc deficiency and you're guided. It's a very um, low ceiling for upper limit of zinc of about 45 milligrams, I think it is for adults. And it's even, you know, a lower limit for children. So uh, in, if you're including a high quality um, multi, uh, in having, you know, the zinc there, the iodine there, maybe choline, some selenium and so forth can, can uh, be helpful. But I think especially uh, for children who are picky eaters and, you know, ten tending towards more of the refined carbohydrates, the pasta and bread and so on, that sometimes trace minerals can get a little low for them and having a good quality multi that includes zinc and, and even iron uh, in many cases can be helpful. And, and of course, iron, uh, we didn't mention, but, but uh, for, for young uh, children, iron deficiency is sort of the number one uh, nutritional deficiency in the world. And so we do wanna make sure that the diet is constructed in a way that we're including a lot of, of iron and zinc rich foods, which means including legumes. And they're not always the easiest things to get into the diets of children. So sometimes a supplement can be useful. I think we should be careful though, assuming that you can take a pill and make up for a, a poor diet choice. Oh, you can't, no. And, and iron particularly is a good example of a supplement. You should be extremely careful of supplementing iron, particularly in males, where you can do a lot of damage to people. And as you pointed out, zinc too, in, in concentrations higher than are desirable. The real answer is to get people eating whole plant food diets. It's not trying to pretend that we're they're gonna eat the crap anyway, and so now we're gonna give them pills. I think that's a, a, a fundamentally philosophical mistake. Oh, I agree completely. And it, there's no supplement that will make up for a bad diet. The diet needs to be as good as possible. But there are instances, especially with picky children, that it could make sense to use use a, a, a good quality multi, a whole food good quality multi. I have to say, I've really enjoyed this conversation, particularly in this question, uh, to hear what all of you say. I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I had a front seat, and I might share this idea for a moment, a fairly front row seat uh, when the whole vitamin supplement business started back in the 80s. It was before, it was somewhat true before that, but during the 80s and after I was on a committee of diet, nutrition, cancer, we spoke and made the point that we didn't see too much uh, uh, evidence to support the use of vitamins. So anyhow, because of that, I was put on a, I was a National Academy representative for a three-year-long trial uh, on the proposition that uh, some entrepreneurs wanted to get together to start selling vitamin supplements. And uh, at that time, uh, so I had three years to look at it fairly closely and look at the evidence in those days, and I've been influenced by that ever since, even more so listening to the three of you right now. But at that time, in 1981, there was this particularly significant paper that came out that caught a lot of attention, namely, there was a study showing that for uh, smokers, heavy smokers, um, smoking 30 years or more, uh, that obviously uh, the ones smoking 30 years or more compared to the ones less, the 30 years or more, they were, they were the ones that really got the, the lung cancer, obviously. But then they did something kind of interesting in that cohort. They took these group, these people and they analyzed or determined beta carotene intake for, for these folks. And what they got out of it was a really fantastic set of data. It was a perfect dose response relationship. Now, they're all, you know, high risk for lung cancer, if you will. But the beta carotene, the higher the beta carotene, the lower was the risk for lung cancer. In fact, it was down to almost non to the non smokers. It was the, I mean, it was really extraordinary that the beta carotene reflecting a plant based diet, obviously, not in those days a real plant based diet, but just enough, just enough that. They really reduced the uh, lung cancer. I was uh, told a little while, uh, I said that one time, somehow I got recorded and I really caught it in a, in, uh, I got a, a uh, challenging comment <laughs> from the group at uh, WHO at the time were trying to get people to stop smoking. Don't, they said, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that because if people are smoking then thought that beta carotene eating plant-based foods, 
you know, would reduce lung cancer, then they could keep on smoking. Uh, and so I got right in the middle of it. Uh, then after that, there was a second study as a follow-up that was conducted where uh, some folks got really interested in the idea that maybe beta carotene might be good to take it in the form of a supplement. So that study was done. You may know this study, I'm not sure, but it was a study during the 80s and reported in early 1990s. What they found was that among the smokers, they, they had intended that this study to go on for about 29,000 smokers. They intended to go on for about eight years because they didn't expect to see a significant result before that time. They had to stop it at five years. And what happened was that the smokers that I mean, they were, were taking a beta carotene, uh, their risk of lung cancer went up. Highly, it was statistically significant. In contrast, in that same study, those consuming the beta carotene as food, it was significantly down. It was a remarkable effect. So beta carotene in the supplement form was not doing the same thing it does in the food. And thereafter, uh, I kind of followed fairly closely a lot of the early studies testing various kinds of supplements on various kinds of conditions. And uh, I was really surprised to see that it's a, a crapshoot when you take a, a vitamin supplements. Right. I, I would I would love to add something to that, Colin. The the um, I, I think one of the reasons may have been that there are what fifty or sixty carotenoids that are commonly present in the variety of foods we eat, and when you take and concentrate, you just you know loading the bloodstream with just one, you you may not absorb the others so well from your food because you're you're saturated with beta carotene. And, you know, there's this, you, you often talk about the synergistic effect of all of these different important components in the diet and how they work together. And I, I, it was my feeling that we saw that result probably because it, it was a variety of carotenoids that provided the advantage when we looked at that biomarker beta carotene being high beta carotene was a marker for all of the carotenoids which probably work synergistically to provide protection rather than just beta carotene and and i think that's why it, it failed and i completely agree that phytochemicals uh, particularly need to come from foods uh, very very important because there are so many and they work together yeah i totally agree with you brenda uh, my point was really just to sort of tell that story because it was a very significant mm -hmm. study at the time. Uh, and uh, the, the beta carotene was reflecting in the food, a whole bunch of other, other carotenoids, about 7,800 or so. So, you know, all that is going on for sure. That was the point I was just trying to make is that's the first observation I saw at the time at a critical point in the history of vitamin supplementation, I would suggest. Mm -hmm that showed this remarkable effect. And they had to stop the study at five years instead of going to full eight. And that was, but at the same time that was going on, there were people in the uh, supplement community who were really anxious to get this, this uh, kind of business going. They came to visit me, I, I knew them, the, the lawyers and some of the others who were wanting to change the laws and get it going. Now, from that point onwards, early nineties at that point onwards, of course, it's, it's exploded, as you know. And I don't know what the latest figures are, but it's like a 50 or $60 billion business. Mm -hmm. I was greatly influenced by the fact that looking at some other studies that came out, supplements, vitamin supplements alone, you can't count on. You can't count on, obviously. Mm -hmm.